Hello you guys, Pascal Gun here, although you can call me Mr. Gonzalez today, and welcome to One Piece Geography 101. Now One Piece and Geography are two things that very much go hand in hand, and that is because if you've read One Piece, you will know that it is one of the best, if not the best anime and manga in terms of world building. And Eitro Oda does this through a mix of history, sociology, politics, but more than anything, geography. And I'm here to tell you all about it. I feel particularly quite qualified to talk about this topic because I am actually a professional geographer. Yes, that's right, I have an undergraduate degree in geography and my real life job, my 9 to 5, is sadly not YouTube, although you can change that by liking this video and subscribing to my channel, but I do actually make maps for a living, which is of course more cartography than geography, but there is quite a bit of overlap between the two. So before starting, we have to ask ourselves, what even is geography? Whenever I tell people that I'm a geographer, they always ask me to list all of the capitals in all the countries in the world. Stop it! And that's not exactly wrong, that is indeed part of geography, it's what you would call political geography, which is the distribution of political entities across space. And that's the key word right there, space. Geography is about the distribution of things, all sorts of things, anything on this planet really, across space. I'm not talking about outer space or anything like that, but I'm talking about the physical plane of existence on which we exist and move and interact with other people and other things. And we can split geography into two facets. The first is human geography, which includes political geography, but more widely deals with the distribution of people and social processes across space, and as well as the meanings that these people attach to certain spaces. We live in a society. And then we have physical geography, which is about the distribution of physical processes, such as volcanology, glaciology, geology, you know, all that pizzazz across space as well. In this video, I'll be talking more about the physical geography of the World of One Piece, which is a topic that Tekken has actually already covered in quite a bit of detail, so there's going to be quite a bit of overlap between this video and his, and I highly suggest that you go and check his out. But whereas Tekken uh, took a more descriptive approach in his video, I wanted to take a bit more of an analytical look at the physical geography of the World of One Piece and give a bit of an overview of the World of One Piece rather than looking at specific islands. So let's get right into it. So simple stuff, the World of One Piece looks like this. It is separated into four blues, the North Blue, South Blue, East Blue, and West Blue, which themselves are split up by the Red Line and the Grand Line, which is itself split into, into Paradise and the New World. We'll be going uh, piece by piece piece, looking at each of these components and talking about first of all what they are and second of all how we can actually understand them using geographic principles from our own world. So first of all we have the four blues which are probably the most normal part of the world one piece and the most uh, relatable to our own world in terms of its uh, geographic and physical characteristics. Of course these blues are filled with a bunch of little islands that you can travel between using normal compasses which indicates that the world one piece does indeed have a magnetic north. Magnet! And that is because normal compasses use magnetized needles or compass roses to point towards the direction of a magnetic north in order to guide you to wherever you want to go. And the existence of a magnetic north in the world one piece also suggests that that world has a very similar structure to our own planet and that it has a solid inner core and a more liquid outer core that creates a magnetic field around the whole planet, thus allowing compasses to function, at least in certain parts of the One Piece world as we will see because they don't function everywhere and anywhere. Next up we have the Red Line which is the singular continent in the world of One Piece and it's essentially a huge ring that serves as a sort of prime meridian in this planet and it splits the north blue from the east blue and the west blue from the south blue. Now the red line is essentially like a super super huge and super super deep barrier that prevents travel between any of the blues except through a specific few spots and unless you belong to a specific few groups that have the technology and the means and the authority to travel between them. One entrance is at Marijuana where if you are with the marines or the world government you can kind of climb up uh, the red line using some sort of like lifts and then back down. You can also go down under Marijuana if you want to reach Fisman Island but for that you'll need a coded ship which not everyone can get access to. And finally, and this is probably the most important entrance point, is Reverse Mountain, which is right here. And it is essentially a series of upside down waterfalls that travel from top to bottom that connect the North Blue, East Blue, West Blue, and South Blue, and go up to the top of the Red Line, and then go back down into Paradise, which would be the entrance of the Grand Line. I think this is quite interesting, because upside down waterfalls aren't 
how waterfalls usually work, right? They usually go from top to bottom because of gravity. Robert, it goes down. No, it don't. It do go down. Oh! But interesting enough, uh, reverse waterfalls do actually exist in our own world, although not in the way that you might imagine. In a very few specific parts of the world, you have these upside down waterfalls that essentially function like normal waterfalls, but are counteracted by super, super strong wind gusts and currents of wind that actually blow the water back over so that it creates a sort of optical illusion that makes it look as though the waterfall is actually going up in the air. So, you know, it's a cool little visual trick. I seriously doubt that a ship would be able to traverse one of those upside down waterfalls. But I think the implication here is that the way in which reverse mountain might be working is that there are such strong wind currents going into these little funnels, into these valleys through which the waterfalls go up, perhaps just because they're the only entryway into the continent that they can create these upside down waterfalls through which ships can traverse. The other feature that separates the four blues is the Grand Line, which runs perpendicular to the red line. And the Grand Line itself is actually separated from each of the blues through the um, calm belt, which is this little area right here to the side, which is a, a sort of strip of sea on either side of the Grand Line that is perpetually still. So therefore it's basically impossible to navigate unless you have a powered ship that can just kind of ride through without wind. And that is also just infested with massive sea kings. So it is both very hard to travel through and just extremely dangerous. Now, in reality, seas and oceans do have periodic periods of calmness, but on average, they will always flow in one direction or another, and this is usually dictated by the wind currents that lie above them. In fact, if you take a world map and you superimpose ocean current and wind current maps on top of those, you will see that they all more or less flow in the same directions. These maps will also show you that the longest uninterrupted stretches of sea usually have the most powerful and dangerous of sea currents, such as on the Southern Sea, which circles the Antarctic. And that is because the longer the stretch of sea, the more space wind has to go through and to infuse energy into the ocean so that it becomes an even stronger current. And the less land masses there are in the way to stop that, the more momentum it will have as it goes. However, the combo doesn't really follow this principle, so we have to explain it in a bit of a different way. Instead of that, we can actually look at another real world equivalent to the calm belt, which is the doldrums. Now, the doldrums are a stretch of ocean that pretty much encapsulates the equator and maybe like five or six degrees north or south from there. And it is a stretch of ocean that sailors have long known to have generally windless waters and that are therefore very hard to traverse. Now, the way this works is that because the tropics receive so much sunlight on average year round, that means that you have a lot of evaporation from the ocean, which then results in warm, moist air, really, that rises vertically, right? So this is physics 101, warm air rises, cold air falls. And because there is so much vertical air movement in the tropics rather than sideways movement, you have, you know, on average, pretty still waters that are just hard to traverse. So once again, another similarity to the real world that we can find in the world of One Piece, the calm belt and the doldrums. Okay, now that we've got everything else out of the way, let's talk about the Grand Line, which is of course the stretch of ocean that we have seen the most of in One Piece. Unlike the four blues where sailors can just traverse from island to island using normal compasses, sailors in the Grand Line can do that because each island has its own little magnetic field that kind of interrupts the wider magnetic field of the ocean and it basically throws a regular compass off. This isn't something that happens in the real world. I mean, at least as far as I'm aware, uh, islands don't have magnetic fields or magnetic fields that are large enough to cause this sort of a disturbance. Instead, a navigator in the Grand Line would have to use a log post that would point in the specific direction of a specific island as it tracks the magnetic fields of islands specifically rather than the magnetic north of the world more generally. Another interesting characteristic of the Grand Line is that the islands in the Grand Line have generally consistent weathers, and islands are divided into summer, winter, spring, and fall islands based on their overall yearly weather pattern. Now, this is sort of similar to our own world because the tropics generally also have more or less stable climates year-round, and that is because they get a, on average, pretty high amount of sunlight throughout the year, with little seasonal variation. However, in the Grand Line, even within a specific island, you can actually have seasons. So you can have a summer island that has a summer, winter, spring, and fall, and a winter island that also has a summer, winter, spring, and fall. And it would essentially mean that the summer in a winter island would be warmer than a winter, but it would still be colder than a summer on a summer island. And this, once again, is something that we also see in the real world 20 extent. If we go back to what I was saying about the doldrums, the doldrums are actually also known as the intertropical convergence zone, which is once again a belt of ocean around the equator that essentially results from a high amount of solar radiation year-round. But 
because of the tilt of the Earth on its rotation axis, which is of about 21 to 24 degrees, as the Earth goes around the Sun throughout the year, the angle at which the Sun hits the tropics slightly changes, and therefore slightly changes also the intensity and the amount of the solar radiation coming in. The result is that the intertropical convergence zone oscillates slightly north and slightly south throughout the year, such that even within the tropics, there is some semblance of seasons, although this is mostly seen in the form of changes in rainfall and slight changes in temperature. Now, one final thing to consider is that the Grand Line is also known for its extremely intense and wild and variable sea climates, right? Whenever we see the straw hats going from one island to another, there's always something new waiting for them in terms of like, I don't know, thunderstorms or snowstorms or tornadoes or whirlpools or whatever, you know, just a whole variety of shenanigans. And even though real world oceans aren't that variable in the amount of weathers that they can have across short spans, we can actually understand this to some degree using real world physics and climatology. If you think back to what I just said a couple minutes ago about the different islands in the Grand Line having more or less stable but different climates in between themselves, the result of this is that when you go from one island to another, you will have masses of air that surround these islands that will have different levels of moisture and temperature, right? Airs that have different densities. When you have something like this in the real world, for instance, when you have a warm mass of air going against a cold mass of air, you have what you would call a weather front, or otherwise known as a warm front or a cold front. Now in these fronts, because of the difference in temperature and density between different masses of air, once you cross from one end of the front to the other, you will experience a super drastic change in temperature and probably also precipitation. That is probably what's happening in the Grand Line, I would assume, because you have such drastic differences in climate between islands that the front between the different air masses that belong to the different islands result in the super rapid changes in seafaring conditions across the Grand Line. Obviously, not to the extent to which it is depicted in one piece, but that would be the general principle, at least on a real world basis. So yeah, that's pretty much it on our One Piece Geography 101. I won't go into the Sky Islands and the Fishman Island because I think that those are topics that deserve their own video and I might get to them eventually. But anyways, you guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it. I would really appreciate it if you comment down below with what you think is the most interesting geographic characteristic of the world One Piece. Because there's really so many things to explore, so many things that I just didn't get to touch upon in this video and that I do want to get to eventually. So please let me know. Also, don't forget to like this video, hit the subscribe button, and to hit the little notification bell on the side so you're notified whenever I upload new videos like this one. This has been Passing Gone, and I am out.